a reading from the second book of Samuel. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies on every side, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God dwells in a tent. Nathan answered the king, Go, do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, Go, tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Should you build me a house to dwell in? It was I that took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. And I will make you famous like the great ones of the earth. I will fix a place for my people, Israel. I will plant them so that they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. Neither shall the wicked continue to afflict them as they did of old, since the time I first appointed judges over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever. Verbum Domini. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, 
to him who can strengthen you, according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages, but now manifested through the prophetic writings, and according to the command of the eternal God, made known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verbum Domini, Deo gratias. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Verbum Domini, Laus Tibi Christe. So today we have the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's also Christmas Eve. And it was in the year 1223 
three years before St. Francis of Assisi died, that he wanted to experience and for the people to experience even more deeply the humility of the incarnation. He wanted to make it very real, tangible. And so it was in Greccio that he created a living manger scene with an ox and an ass, with the manger where hay was brought to fill the manger. And the solemnities of the mass were celebrated there and Francis was a deacon. And so he sang the gospel and then he preached about the babe of Bethlehem and the chorus of the people's voices and singing and the praises of God radiated off the rocks, echoed off the rocks. And so it was just this resounding praise that happened that Christmas Eve in 1223. And the biographer of St. Francis, Thomas of Celano, he said this, he said that Francis, he sings the Holy Gospel, he has a powerful voice, a pleasant voice, a clear voice, a musical voice. Burning with excessive love, he often calls Christ the babe from Bethlehem whenever he means to call him Jesus. Saying the word Bethlehem in the manner of a bleeding sheep, he fills his whole mouth with sound, but even more with sweet affection. He seems to lick his lips whenever he uses the expressions Jesus or babe of Bethlehem. Tasting the word on his happy palate and savoring the sweetness of the word, the gifts of the Almighty are multiplied there. And Thomas went on to say that the priest enjoyed a special consolation, Francis seems to, as, as well at length the night's solemnities draw to a close and everyone went home with joy. And then he says miracles happened after that. They would take the hay from that manger and it was brought to those who were suffering different afflictions and they were healed. Women who have difficulties giving labor, it was brought to them and they had a safe and happy delivery. And so there were these miracles that happened and he went on to say that then later an altar was built on that very spot in a church which stands today in Greccio. Why? So that humans henceforth for the healing of body and soul would eat the flesh of the immaculate and spotless lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us with supreme and indescribable love. It was about 30 years later, the last Christmas of St. Clair's life. So Francis died in 1226, St. Clair died in 1253 in August. And it was the last Christmas of her life that she was very ill and she wasn't able to go then to the, the night mass and the matins that were going to be sung, but the sisters went there to the Franciscan church. And it was there that she's alone and she says to the Lord with a sigh, and we have this in the acts of the canonization. These were interviews that were done with the sisters that knew her and they, three of them recounted this event. Sister Philippa, Sister Amata and Sister Balvina all recounted this event in Claire's life. And so she was there alone and she said with a sigh, Lord God, look, I have been left here alone with you. And immediately she began to hear the singing that was going on in the church. And Sister Amata said that she saw the manger of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sister Balvina added that St. Clair later said to her sisters, you left me here alone, but the Lord has taken good care of me because I was not able to get up from my bed. So she was able to experience a special Christmas grace on Christmas Eve and it was because of this event that Pope Pius XII in 1958 made her the patroness of television. In fact, one of the biographies of St. Clair puts this vision of St. Clair under the heading, a televised Christmas mass. <laughs> and so 
Pope Pius XII in 58, as television is growing more and more in usage, saw the need to put it under a heavenly patroness so that it would be directed in a better way. And so it was a daughter of St. Clair, Mother Angelica, that brought, had such an impact in doing this very thing. So another special Christmas Eve grace. It was in 1886, St. Therese, she was 13 years old at this point, and one of the practices of children at that time is they'd put their shoes before the fireplace, and when they got back from the midnight mass, there would be little gifts in their shoes. Well, she was 13. She had hung on to this tradition of the children. And so they got back from the midnight mass, and she recounts this in her autobiography, Story of a Soul. She says, we got home and I knew that I should find my shoes standing at the fireplace filled with presents, as I had always done since I was little. So you can see I was still treated as a baby. Father used to love to see how happy I was and hear my cries of delight as I took each surprise packet from my magic shoes and his pleasure made me happier still. But the time had come for Jesus to cure me of my childishness, childishness. Even the innocent joys of childhood were to go. He allowed Father to feel cross this year. He's a little cranky after the midnight mass. And instead of spoiling me, as I was going upstairs, I heard him, be, heard him say, Therese ought to have outgrown all this sort of thing, and I hope this will be the last time. This cut me to the quick, and Celine, who knew how very sensitive I was, whispered to me, don't go down just yet. You'll only cry. And typically she would have done that. She just cried like a, a little baby. But this time was different. Something happened. Jesus gave her a special grace. And she continued, I was not the same Therese anymore. Jesus changed me completely. I held back my tears and trying to stop my heart, I ran down into the dining room, picked up the shoes and wrapped my presents joyfully, looking all the while as happy as a queen. Father did not look cross anymore and entered into the fun of it. While well, Celine thought she must have been dreaming because she wasn't pouting as she usually would have. But this was no dream. Therese had gotten back forever the strength of mind she had lost at four and a half when her mother had died of breast cancer. She had become very sensitive and then her, her older sisters went off to the Carmelite monastery and so all this abandonment that she had experienced and this pain made her very sensitive but now she received what she would later call this Christmas miracle where she'd be detached from so much of this sensitivity that she had experienced. Another Christmas grace. And then one final one that I wanted to relate this morning as well is a personal one to me I've related before of my great great uncle Andy Hemmer. So my great grandmother's brother who lived into his 90s and I came to know him and he would he had lost totally the vision in his right eye and he could barely see out of his left eye. He was legally blind, declared legally blind. But he had heard me speak of this prayer, the novena, the Christmas novena. So it's a prayer that recounts the graces of that first Christmas. Hail and blessed be the hour and moment in which the Son of God was born of the most pure Virgin Mary at midnight in Bethlehem in piercing cold. In that hour vouchsafe, O oh my God, to hear my prayers and grant my desires through the merits of our Savior Jesus Christ and of his blessed mother, amen. And he would pray that prayer all day long. He wanted so badly to be able to see so that he could continue to write and correspond with his friends and his family, which he loved doing. And it was in the middle of the night, Christmas Eve, that he has this terrible pain in his right eye and something comes out of it and he receives his Vision. He continued to pray that prayer and his left eye improved as well. 
And people would later ask his family, is your, how are your dad's eyes? Is he still, yeah, he's still doing well. He could hardly speak at the Christmas uh, meal that they had with the family that day because he was so overwhelmed with gratitude for this favor that he received. And I still have the letters that he wrote to me about this and how thankful he was for the grace that he had been given that Christmas Eve. So my point here as we are approaching now the beginning of the Christmas season is that we are remembering the most important event in all of human history which has continued to radiate and echo throughout the centuries in the lives of people like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Clair of Assisi, St. Therese of Lisieux, so many others, my own family, that story that I related, and so many others could tell their own stories of a special Christmas grace. Because it is the central moment in all of human history that you could ask historians, what was the most important moment in all of human history? And unless they said it was the incarnation of the Son of God, they would be wrong. Because that's the most significant event in all of human history. And today's colic that we had, the opening prayer for the Mass, is actually the concluding prayer for the Angelus, which we typically pray three times a day, 6 a.m. noon, 6 p.m., remembering the Incarnation and bringing, if you will, some of that grace of that moment to the earth. And every Hail Mary that we pray in a way recalls that marvelous event and brings some of the grace of that moment that this grace time has for each of us. We know in the readings today that now as we've been reading through the prophets in the Old Testament, there's been this longing of the prophets for the coming of the Messiah, this speaking of the Messiah who is to come. And Nathan gives David this prophecy in today's first reading from the second book of Samuel, chapter 7. And Nathan tells David that there's going to be something wonderful that God is going to do for him. David had wanted to build a solid house, not just a tent in which the Ark of the Covenant would reside, but a, a temple worthy of the Lord. He wanted, and he was a man after the Lord's own heart, the scriptures tell us, he wanted God at the center of his kingdom. So that was what at, was at his heart. But Nathan says, God's going to do something for you. And what is God's promise to David? That he's going to give him a dynasty, a house. So he's going to establish his house. That there's going to be an heir after him and his kingdom will be firm. I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. He'll be a son of God. Your house, your dynasty, and your kingdom shall endure forever. Your throne shall stand firm forever. So we can think of, for example, in our faith, the Catholic faith, we have the feast of the chair of St. Peter. That represents his authority. So this is something that wouldn't just be held by one man, but it'd be this authority throughout the centuries. And David is told too that his throne, his authority, his kingdom is going then to endure and stand firm forever. And then our Psalm today, Psalm 89, also continues that theme. The promises of the Lord I will sing forever. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David my servant. Forever will I confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. He shall say to me, you are my father. Now, all of this seemed to have been lost because what happened after David has made this, this promise by God 
is that then it wasn't long after that that the kingdom divided into two. And it wasn't long after that, well, it was some time after that, that the northern kingdom would be taken into exile and dispersed. And then later, the southern kingdom would also be brought into Babylon in a captivity. So it seemed like it was all lost. Where is this enduring kingdom? But even in Babylon, in captivity, the Jews kept their genealogy. They knew who was descended from who and who was of the throne of David, who was of the royal king, uh, who was of that royal line. Just like today, we're very interested, right, in the British uh, monarchy and who are the princes and what are they doing. And so this was something important to the people of of Israel in captivity, the people of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin who were in captivity to keep alive this uh, awareness of who was the genealogy. It was later than they would be restored and Judah was actually one of the smallest of the tribes of Judah that today's gospel now is coming, uh, coming before our, our eyes to look at this that there's going to be one who is of the royal family, Joseph. But we know also that in the circumstances in which he lived, they they were poor. They offered two two turtle doves, the offering of the poor uh, in the temple. But he is of the house of David. He is of the royal family. And what is Our Lady told? She's told that this prophecy that was made to David is now going to be realized. It seemed like it was all going to be lost. There's going to be this sprout that springs from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David, and it seemed like it had just been cut off. But there's, there's still life in it, and now there's going to be this springing forth of this life from the stump of Jesse. And so Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel, is sent from God. He's sent from God. He goes to Our Lady. And he's basically saying that all of this longing, this promise that was made to David, is now the time has come for this to be fulfilled. So the prophecy that was made to David, I will make you a great name. The Annunciation, Gabriel says, he will be great. The prophecy to David, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Gabriel to Mary, the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. The prophecy to David of Nathan, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Gabriel to Mary, and he will be called the son of of the Most High. The prophecy to David, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever. Gabriel to Mary, of his kingdom there will be no end. So my dear people, we are filled with hope. Even in the clamorous times in which we live and the difficult times and challenges that we face, that we know that God has entered into human history. And that's what we're about to celebrate in this beautiful Christmas evening and Christmas celebration, that God so loved the world, that he sent his son, that all who believe in him would not die, but would live forever.